studying Edexcel IGCSE English language and keen to clap your eyes on an outstanding question for exploring the language and structure of the explorer's daughter. Hard edged, hard nosed, hard to beat. Schofield on Shakespeare. So this question is out of 12. You need to show a perceptive understanding of the effects of language and structure and be reasonably technical in your analysis. Try to use some subject terminology for every quotation that you explore. There are 12 marks for this question, so try to analyse 12 quotations split into four different paragraphs. However, make sure that you're sharply focused on the question and don't just regurgitate generic analysis from your own annotations. Subject terminology is very important with this exam board. Make sure that your analysis is as technical as possible. My assumption is that you already know the text reasonably well. Can you therefore match up some of these trickier words with their meanings? What a useful revision exercise. Press pause now. Here are your answers. Plumes, of course, are clouds of something. Billows typically constitute smoke or cloud. To be mischievous is to cause mischief or to misbehave in a generally non-serious way. When it's temperate, it's not too hot or cot, like the weather in Madeira, for instance. A harpoon is a barbed spear-like object generally used at sea. A predilection is a preference for something. A knoll is a small hill or a mound, and something flimsy is something feeble, something easily broken. In this video, we're going to explore this question. How does Herbert use language and structure to present the tension of the hunt? Jot this down. And consider the text in light of this question as it appears on screen at five second intervals. I'd recommend adding additional annotations to your own copy of the text, choosing quotations particularly pertinent to this question. So here are my annotations from the first paragraph. Notice how I don't just underline keywords and phrases willy-nilly. I genuinely annotate using technical terminology such as present participle, simple sentence, metaphor, and explore the effect in relation to the question. So have a look at my annotations on the text as a whole, pressing pause on each slide to absorb and ponder. Time now to write your own essay, which you'll be able to compare with mine. How does Herbert use language and structure to present the tension of the hunt? Remember to write four chunky paragraphs, each exploring three quotations and using subject terminology. No need for an introduction or a conclusion. Get cracking. It's pause time. How did he get on? Produce a delicious, mouth-watering response. Time to compare your response with my 12 out of 12 cracker. 
tension is built up early on in the passage with a reference to the narrator's eagerness to view the hunt from the shore. In order to try to see exactly what is happening, she ends up scrambling back up to the lookout. The present participle scrambling implies that she's so keen to see the movement of the beautiful narwhals that she is awkwardly using her hands as well as her feet in order to climb to the lookout point as quickly as possible. Whilst the pods of narwhals are described in majestic detail within longer sentences, it is notable that the hunters are referenced within a much shorter, stark, simple sentence. She writes, the hunters were dotted all around the fjord. This simple sentence creates a sense of drama about the hunt that is to come. The reader gets the impression of human hunters lurking, ready to strike with their harpoons. Meanwhile, the final sentence of the first paragraph adds further tension due to the inability of the narrator to see exactly what is happening from her vantage point. She wonders whether the narwhals may be present at all at this moment, or whether they could be mischievous tricks of the shifting light. This metaphor not only confirms just how difficult it is to see the narwhals from the shore, but also implies their potential elusiveness. It may be very difficult indeed for the hunters to locate and kill them, thus increasing the tension. Within the second paragraph of the text, the writer explains the background to the hunting and states that in summer the hunters of Thule are fortunate to witness the annual return of the narwhal. The noun summer highlights the very limited time period in which hunting can take place, increasing tension due to the lack of further opportunities across the rest of the year. Hunting for these particular humans is clearly incredibly important. The writer refers to the matak or blubber of the whale being rich in necessary minerals and vitamins, a rich source of vitamin C. The semantic field of nutrition confirms that hunting these animals does not take place for fun or for frivolous sporting reasons, but to ensure humans can maintain their health and well-being. In addition to ensuring human health, the meat from the narwhal can facilitate human transportation within the freezing cold climate. A single narwhal can feed a team of dogs for an entire month. The use of parentheses provides additional detailed factual information which highlights the crucial importance of the hunt to the Inuit community. Tension is therefore built up as the reader realises that without an occasional successful hunt, the humans would face very significant difficulties in their lives, potentially starvation. The hunt is so important that it appears the entire community is engaged, either participating or watching. Using binoculars, the wives watch their husbands progress intently, knowing their husbands instinctively. These adverbs add tension as they highlight the intensity and single-mindedness with which they track the hunt. The adverb instinctively suggests the wives have an innate appreciation of the position of their husband, even though he is so far away at sea. Before any attack has taken place, the narrator sets the scene and emphasises the complex difficulties involved for the hunters. It was like watching a vast waterborne game with the hunters spread like a net. The first simile stresses the importance of human athleticism and the need for a clear strategy, particularly given the lack of boundaries. At sea, both hunter and hunted could potentially travel in numerous directions for several miles. Meanwhile, the second simile suggests that humans may have an unfair advantage in this battle. They may be able to figuratively scoop the narwhals out of the water simply due to their sheer numbers and ability to surround them. Yet the narrator confirms that these creatures are not like feeble foolish fish who can easily be caught in a literal net. They are intelligent creatures with keen senses and the ability to talk to one another under the water. This tricolon within a compound sentence confirms that the narwhal are likely to be a formidable foe and also implies conflicting feelings about hunting them. These creatures seem rather like human beings in their ability to experience feelings, thus increasing the tension as the hunt begins. Do we feel comfortable with this hunt taking place at all? In the final section of the text, the writer references a human aiming with his harpoon, but does not immediately tell us the outcome. He gently picked up his harpoon and aimed. In that split second, 
The dash abruptly breaks up the flow of the sentence and builds up tension as we are told about the narrator's feelings, as opposed to whether the aim was successful. In addition, the writer highlights the vulnerability of the hunters during this attack. They are on flimsy kayaks, each with only one harpoon, engaged in a foolhardy exercise. These adjectives confirm the huge risks being taken by the hunters, once again emphasising the critical importance of humans being able to consume and use narwhal meat and tusks. This point is emphasised further in the closing simple sentence of the piece, hunting is still an absolute necessity in Thule. The tautological phrase, absolute necessity, makes it abundantly clear that the hunting of narwhal has no relation whatsoever to the battering of seals for fur, and is something that is central to their survival. Tension remains in the passage as the modern reader may need to uncomfortably reassess their feelings about the rights and wrongs of hunting such majestic, enormous creatures. Why does this achieve the full 12 marks? Well, it starts off with a topic sentence which answers the question and doesn't waffle, thank God. The question asks about tension, and so I use the word tension in this topic sentence. No messing. Have a look at the length of my quotations in this paragraph. Maximum length eight words, and all of them seamlessly embedded within the sentence so that the sentence flows and makes clear grammatical sense. Notice how I requote scrambling. This helps my analysis be more precise and perceptive. It's also important that you move seamlessly and logically between your points and ensure an overall coherent response to the question. Connectives such as in addition and therefore can help you with this, whilst it can also be a good idea to return explicitly to the question at the end of a main paragraph in order to develop your initial points. Within this paragraph, note the consistent use of subject terminology. Adverb, adverb, simile, simile, tricolon, compound sentence. Unsure what a compound sentence is? Where have you been? Watch this video immediately. It's said that you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Well, can you get a grade nine without watching Schofield on Shakespeare? I've been helping you develop an even better understanding of question four for Edexcel IGCC English Language, The Explorer's Daughter. Many thanks for watching.